better than that. Come on. How's everybody doing tonight? Hi, my name is Stephanie Meppa. I am the CEO of Mansueto Ventures, which is Inc.'s parent company. And it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Laurie, who is the serial entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur. This man has founded a lot of companies that you've heard of, from diapers.com to Jet, and a couple of companies that you um, have recently been introduced to, including Wizard. Uh, you just heard from uh, Melissa. And we're going to talk a little bit about Wonder, which is a company that you have founded, and you are now also the chairman and CEO of Wonder. So, Mark, welcome. Thank you, Stephanie. Tell us what is Wonder. <clears throat> oh, well, <laughs> we, we believe everyone has a right to great food. It's always good, I think, to start with the mission statement. Um, you know, I watched sort of the boom in delivery aggregators, DoorDash and Uber Eats, and people not wanting to cook anymore and the convenience of just getting uh, food delivered home. But there were a lot of shortcomings, like the food, I, I was a big user of it. Food would often come cold, late, expensive, wasn't high quality, I just felt there had to be a better way. Um, and so taking a page out of sort of the e-commerce playbook of, of bringing goods to people's homes, I thought, okay, we'll bring food to people's homes, which the aggregators were doing but just not doing well, how do we do it better? It's basically, how about bringing the restaurant to the person's home? And that, so what we decided to do was basically create a mobile restaurant. A restaurant that was mobile, um, could basically go out on the road during the night, stocked with all the night's foods and meals, and just like you would order an Uber, you would see the restaurant is seven minutes away, you'd click on it, the restaurant would pull up to your front door, would cook the, cook the food and bring it to your door, piping hot, really high quality. So easier said than done. We've now created 17 of these mobile restaurant chains, everything from Bobby Flay State at the high end, down to burgers and pizza and everything in between, Chinese, Japanese, Mexican, Italian, um, all, all the different cuisines, Greek. And they're all out on the road all night. Food's prepared in the central commissary, but then put into kits that are on these mobile uh, mobile restaurants and literally um, you just pull up the app you see 17 different cuisines you see the time that each one is away from you it pulls up cooks the food the right outside your door but the the key to the model and it really took us three and a half years of R&D we, we did a hundred and fifty million dollar seed round literally just to do the food R&D and food science and engineering to be able to make high quality food across 17 cuisines on a fungible tech platform so this mobile truck you know has a high speed um uh, impingement oven it's not a microwave the food is actually cooked there but it's done with someone who's very um low skilled or or very little training can cook and pump out this high quality food across 17 different chains that's sort of the magic of wonder that's the the asset that we've built over the last three and a half years and now we're live in like 17 towns in new jersey we've got 110 mobile restaurants on the road. We're adding about 10 per week. Um, and customers are loving it. Um, as you might imagine, it's as good as it sounds. Um, we see NPS scores in the 70s. The order density that we're seeing is about where Amazon was in, in 2011 already. So, you know, in a small town, we're getting hundreds of orders on a single night. Um, obviously, people love it. The key is how do you make the unit economics work? And I'm sure that's your next question. <laughs> well, I, I do want to get into that. But first, um, I wanted to ask, so you started this three and a half years ago. So you had the idea pre-pandemic. It, it was before, yeah. Yeah. And, and so how did the, um, the, 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 the real customer need for at-home dining change or accelerate any of your plans? Yeah. I mean, COVID, uh, we weren't planning on that, but that's certainly been an accelerant. Um, and you see it happening with the delivery aggregators, too. It's just people are now just more accustomed to ordering food and more comfortable ordering food at home. So yeah, no, it, it, we just got lucky basically, yeah. which is, you know, as any startup founder, you need a little bit of luck every once in a while. Well, we got lucky and uh, people are ordering more than they, they would have before COVID. Yeah. Before we get to the unit economics, can you talk a little bit about what the community reaction has been? I've got to imagine that at a time when a lot of restaurants are going out of business, having a mobile restaurant chain come in, um, has you know been a challenge to navigate? 
that was something that we definitely were concerned about. We have a good government relations team that built great relationships in the community. We've done a lot for the community, Wonder has. Um, but we also uh, launched simultaneously with, with Wonder Mobile Restaurants. We all also did off, um, also launch a delivery aggregator, a competitor to DoorDash called Envoy. And on the Wonder app, you have two tabs. You have the mobile restaurants and you have delivery from local restaurants, which is exactly the same as a DoorDash, but it allows the local restaurants to participate on the Wonder platform. Because the first party mobile restaurant business, so many people are using it and there's so much demand that if you can't find what you're looking for on any one of the mobile restaurants and you want to buy it from the local restaurant, we'll, we'll do that as well. And so local restaurants like have seen you know, their orders spike by being on the Wonder platform. So that's um, you know been, been a good thing for the community as well. So we haven't really felt um, you know that from the community. Right. The, the business that you mentioned, the DoorDash Uber Eats business, Clearly, it's it's hard to make money in that business. How do you make money with Wonder? Yeah, so it is hard to make money because you're sort of playing that broker between the restaurant and the customer, and ultimately the customer is paying a premium to get the food delivered. Right? There's a delivery fee, and the restaurants aren't you know able to cover it because they don't have great margins either. But at Wonder, we're vertically integrated, so we are the restaurant. So if you think about it, because we're operating, if you, if you look at Wonder relative to the restaurant and delivery, think about this. We're, we're cooking at massive scale in the commissary, scale that is well beyond any, any restaurant. So we're buying food at great cost. We're cooking it um, at, at you know, much lower cost than it would be for a restaurant. Our capex of the truck relative to the restaurant itself is actually lower. And then on the delivery side, DoorDash or Uber Eats have to go point, they have to go to the restaurant, pick it up, and then deliver it. And on average, it takes over 20 minutes. Because we stock the trucks uh, at the beginning of the night and they just go point to point, the actual delivery time is only about 8.7 minutes today. And as we density improves, that drive time comes down. So because you don't have to go point to point, it's a huge advantage. We actually um, are projecting to get the drive time down to five minutes, the way uh, we're projecting. So if we're buying chicken or buying meat, that might be from multiple restaurants. So we're buying by the truckload in full quantity. Um, but the actual recipes and things are meant to be very specific to the restaurant. So it's not, Wonder is not some big, huge diner that carries everything. It literally is a uh, a combination of, of the best restaurants and chefs from around the country. And we've got, you know, uh, Bobby Flay, we've got Nancy Silverton from Pizzeria Mozzo, we've got Tejas Barbecue from not too far from here, Fred's Meat and Bread Burger Place out of Atlanta, you know, we've got Marcus Samuelson, we've got some incredible chefs and some incredible restaurants that are available on the platform. And we sort of strike a deal where we own the rights to it. Um, and then we build a restaurant around it. And, and how do you think about expansion? <laughs> what are the markets that, how do you decide what market you want to enter next? Um, we, we built a model that basically predicts what demand would be in a particular area based on a number of factors, demographics and income and household size and things. And just in the area of New Jersey we're in right now, these 17 towns, we're going to grow uh, from that core out um, to about 50, I think it's 57 towns over the next like 12, 15 months. And that's what we're calling region one. And that's a solid region. We expect to do about a hundred million in revenue in that region. We want to perfect the technology, get the unit economics right so we can make money in that in that one region. And then the idea is to replicate it across the country. And we see about 500 regions that look like this across the country. We haven't decided yet what the order of those will be, but it will take some number of years, probably, probably close to 10 years to replicate this across the entire US. Uh, at the beginning of the conversation, we mentioned a couple of the ventures you're involved in. I mean, you have either funded or co-founded everything from, you know, Wizard, which again, Melissa's here, um, but also you've got an air taxi company, you have the Minnesota Timberwolves, you have a WNBA team, but of all the businesses that you're involved in, you decided to be chairman and CEO of a food truck company. So <laughs> what, what is it about this business that is commanding your attention? 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, I always think about mission and vision in terms of what really what really drives me in terms of passion. On the mission side, this idea that you know we we believe everyone has a right to great food. That mission really inspires me. I think there's plenty of places around the world or even in America where you can't get access to to great food, um, even even wholesome, delicious food. Uh, the food deserts. We know the problem there. We're able with these mobile restaurants to access those areas, and neighborhoods, and do it in a way that is economically viable. We can bring great food to food deserts. That that and, and also, you know, in places around the world, like the technology that we've built, the three and a half years so far of R and D and food science, and the three hundred million dollars we've invested in that, allows us to put an oven. All you need is an oven, this this high speed impingement oven, and put that oven anywhere in the world. And we can send food that's basically through food science could last up to 30 days that literally can be put in the oven, a button pushed, and pump out incredible tasting food that's nutritious, that's wholesome, great tasting. That's the IP. That's kind of what we built. So that inspires me, and that, that's got me really fired up. And then just the, the bigness of the vision, how big it can be. In the area that we're in right now, if we extrapolate the sales that we're doing today it's already fifty billion dollars in the U.S., so it's like massive TAM. Um, it can be very profitable. Like we're we have some restaurants that are already over twenty percent operating margin. So it has like the there's not many businesses out there that can be, you know, as big as let's say Amazon top line, with double digit operating margins. Like that is that's a massive like business. That's a multi trillion dollar market cap company. So it's it's the vision and the mission, both of them check big check marks in terms of what, what motivates me and the passion. And um, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Mark, I want to push you just a little bit on um, delivering food to underserved markets because the, the, the 17 towns you're in right now, you know, Westfield, New Jersey is not exactly a food desert. Can, can you talk a little bit about what you might actually need to do to, to, to serve communities that are, you know, not typically- These rice side, um, that's one concept. Another concept, Mexican, where it's family style, tacos. You can fill the tacos with whatever you want, guac and vegetables and chicken and things. $40 for a family of four to five. That's not that much more expensive than fast food. And and I think the market is there for it. I think there just isn't the access. So if you do live in one of those areas, maybe this is available, this $40 meal, but how do you get to it? It's not in your area because there's no restaurants that are sort of popped up because it's not viable to put a put a restaurant there. But with our mobile restaurants, it's basically a fractional restaurant. Like um, each truck is about one twenty. So if the demand is three twentieths of a restaurant, restaurant can't go there. We could put three trucks. That's the concept: is that we can we can bring food there because we're. Um, creating fractions of restaurants instead of having to make the decision of whether or not a full restaurant works. Also, the CapEx is variable. And so with a restaurant, one of the biggest risks is you put a stake in the ground. If you don't hit that revenue target, you're dead in the water. For us, we can go into a place and see what the demand is and service it with the right amount of restaurants. If it's two, if it's one, great. Three, four, five, it doesn't matter. And we can adjust it on a daily basis. If the demand changes over time, we could adjust. It's not a one-way door. Putting on your Envoy hat for a minute, what do you think happens to all of these rapid delivery app businesses, whether it's DoorDash and Uber Eats, but the, the GoPuffs and, and, and others? I mean, it feels like it's a really crowded market and nobody's making money. It does feel like that. I mean, one of the things after doing Jet, at Jet, we got to a billion in sales in 10 months. And... While that might seem impressive, I wasn't that proud of it because we spent a lot of money in marketing. We bought customers and we were in a commodity business where the margins were really low. At best, low single digit profit margins. And with Wonder, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to play the commodity game. And you mentioned some players there that are sort of playing that game. I wanted to create a long standing business that had incredible TAM and upside, but also could generate double digit operating margins. And so I do think, you know, given the fact that our first party business is so profitable and we're able to attract customers without even offering any discounts. I don't know any B2C businesses that don't say, hey, try us, here's five bucks off, here's 10, we have never used a discount. And we've already had 
in our earliest town, we have 63% household penetration, meaning that 63% of all the homes have tried us. We've never used a discount. So that's the kind of business we wanted to create. And I think um, the, the Envoy, basically the competitor to DoorDash that we launched on the Wonder app, we spent zero dollars on marketing, not even a penny of marketing. That's already 25% of our business. So I think what that proves to me is that the first party mobile restaurant business is sort of that Trojan horse. It goes, builds a relationship without a lot of money in marketing. And once you've got that relationship, you can then basically, you know, offer Envoy, you could offer meal kits, you could offer any other kinds of ways that people might want to order their dinner or lunch or breakfast off the same platform. So it's, it's, it's really, um, it's really a great way to build a relationship. But you didn't answer my question. What happens to the other guys? You could tell me. I, I'm just telling you. <laughs> I'm just telling you. But, but you're a smart guy. I mean, do, do they consolidate? What are the scenarios? Is it okay. consolidation yeah. or does it just cease to exist as a business? I, well, I think, I think each business needs to find it their own way and figure out what they do really well. I think there's definitely, I think, some white space for somebody to own last mile logistics, like as a logistics company. Is there an opportunity for, for Uber or DoorDash or one of these to be sort of that last mile logistics company and be able to bring you toilet paper and pet food and, and uh, other people's packages and things and literally be the FedEx of last mile? I think there's an opportunity for that. I think it's dangerous when any company loses, loses focus and you don't know exactly what you are. And I'm not close enough to it to know, but I, I think everyone has to figure out like, what is your primary purpose and who are you? as a company, and I, I, I've watched some of these delivery aggregators morph from food into commodity goods and convenience store items and pet food and alcohol and those sorts of things. Um, and so I think they're in a transition period and they have to figure out who they are. I know who we are at Wonder, we're about serving customers' needs when it comes to mealtime. So when you go on the Wonder app, you will only see food, ever. We're never, we're never going to sell pet food. We're never going to sell diapers and commodity goods. We are going to sell food. If you're hungry and you want to eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you're going to get the Wonder app, and you either get food delivered from a local restaurant, you'll get it cooked outside your door, you'll buy a meal kit, you'll buy food to put in your, in, in, you know, frozen food to put in your oven. Like However you want to eat, any meal, any occasion will be there for you. And, and I think the clarity of, of, of the vision is really important for any company. And... Um, I'm not close enough to know what, what their vision will be, but I know it's changing. Yeah. Um, just wanted to let everybody know, we will take a couple of questions from the audience in a few minutes, so please get your questions for Mark ready. Mark, in addition to being a founder, you're also an investor um, through VCP. T can you just talk a little bit about what you look for in a founder that you want to back and partner with? Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, we, we started a venture capital fund with uh, Alex Rodriguez. It's called VCP, Vision Capital People. And the, the, the premise is, is very simple. It's this idea of go big early. And as an entrepreneur, I always got caught up in this chicken and egg thing where I know it takes great people to make your vision happen. But often you, you can't hire the very best people day one because you don't have the capital. And it's like this chicken and egg problem. Um, and so you have to sort of like step into it slowly. This concept is more founder comes with a really big idea and a big vision. And we say, okay, great. Here's $10 million seed capital. Go hire the very best team, build a product, and then we'll help you raise 50 million of which we'll do 20 of it to basically blow this thing out. And, and the idea is that you can create the winners. If you have a great founder in a big market with a big vision and they're able to hire the very best people, there's a really high probability it's gonna work. Most startups don't work. But I think in this case, with the right capital and the right founder, I think most will work. And so that, that's sort of the, the, the philosophy. Th that is clearly not every business you see, right? Every, yeah. I mean, th th that formula that you've laid out, those truly are the unicorns. And I don't mean that in the you know, commonplace word, but in the sense of the word, but in the, the, the original sense of the word. So how do you, how do you find those folks? And, and again, how do you know an idea is big enough to justify that $10 million seed? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think that's the art of it. Um, it is finding founders that basically are thinking big, really big, in a big market with a big TAM, 
um, and they've got the the sort of the, the, the spotic traits I call them. They're they're smart, passionate, optimistic, tenacious, adaptable, kind, and empathetic. Those are the traits I look for in these entrepreneurs. Can you run those through those again? Because I know you. This is this yeah. is an acronym you all should be writing down. Spotic, smart, passionate, optimistic, adaptable, tenacious, kind, and empathetic. Um, and and uh, I think I, I think I caught them all there, right? <laughs> Um, and, and the key is, you know, uh, early on it was, it was kindness and empathy was sort of an add on. I think people, uh, kind of viewed kindness as sort of like, oh, you got to throw in a soft, soft skill there. And that wasn't what it was meant to be. Truly kindness and empathy are much more important than people think in terms of whether or not an entrepreneur or even a, a person in a startup is going to be successful or not. Those softer skills really matter. Because how you treat people, it, it you know goes to the culture you're creating, and it's one of the reasons why I think I think people have followed me in startups is that I, I place a really high emphasis on on the culture and treating people right and putting that before dollars and cents, and that often leads to dollars and cents because people are happy, they're motivated, you're attracting the best people, and they're giving you the very best they've got. But if you just go out and hire people that are passionate and tenacious and they want, and they have that drive, that's great, but they're going to run people over and they're, they're not going to bring people along with them. And I find that people that value kindness and empathy bring people along with them as well. And that's, that's the key. We talked about the kinds of founders that need a $10 million seed round. I'm curious, to get a sense from you more broadly, not necessarily wearing your VCP hat, when is the right time for a founder to take outside capital? And and you know what would you advise to some of the founders in the room here today who are thinking about trying to raise money? Uh, uh, every situation is bored in the right way. Um, it's okay. I, I've owned companies that have where I've, I've personally owned, you know, only only ten or fifteen percent but felt like I've had full control over the company because I controlled the board of directors. So don't think of the percentage ownership, this whole idea of like 51%, 49, that is, that means nothing. It literally is, um, you own a percentage of the company and that's one thing. And then secondly, do you control the board of directors? Are you the one that, that basically can control the decisions made? And those are two separate things. So just keep that in mind. Um, the other thing is people get worried, oh, well, this is my company, it's my idea. And, I'm going to like give it away and I'm only going to have 20% or 10%. Well, 10% of a billion dollar exit is a pretty good outcome. I think most would agree and multi-billion even better. So I wouldn't worry about dilution. I would literally just try and raise as much capital as you can. That's sort of the barometer. If you can raise capital, raise it um, and, and put that capital to work in a way that allows you to raise even more capital, even a bigger valuation. As a rule of thumb, what I always like to do is raise capital, a certain valuation, and then next round, know I have enough capital to double the valuation and double the amount raised in the next round. And then double the valuation and double the amount raised. So that's sort of what I've done in all my startups. What I'm doing with Wonder actually is 150 million seed, double the round valuation, raise 300 million, double the valuation again, raise 600 million. That's exactly what I'm doing. And it could be done at that scale or it could be done at the sort of five, 10, 20. It could be done at 50, 100, 200. But this idea of like taking that capital in and putting it to work in a way that grows the valuation by enough to warrant a doubling of the valuation and doubling of the raise. And that's how you create really big companies quickly. Jet was you know, two years to three three point three billion exit. That was the same basically playbook, you know, just raising a lot of money early and, and putting the money to work so that you can double and, and grow the company. So Great advice. Um, why don't we take some questions? Um, we have a mic runner, I believe. Great. Maria, uh, can you, there's a gentleman right there. Hey, Mark. My name is Sri Guti, and uh, my question is on your, the mission statement that you mentioned, right? Everybody has access, needs access to great food. So a lot of businesses struggle with that massively transformative purpose, right? So I would love to hear from you. How did you land at that? What is the backstory? And uh, you know, would love to hear from you on that. Sure, Thank sure. You. I mean, first off, um, I'll just say it 
I know a lot of people probably hear the word mission and vision, and I find that a lot of people get those terms confused. So I think it's important to just like talk about the definition of each. I think mission is your highest purpose. It's why you exist. It's your North Star. It's the ultimate why. If you come up with a mission statement and you write it out, ask yourself, why, why is this the mission statement? Like, it, What's the answer to that why? And when there's no answer, you know you're at the ultimate mission statement. And a lot of people, that's not, not the case, at least in, in decks and things that I see. You get to that ultimate why, that is the centerpiece of your culture. It's the reason why people want to come work for the organization. It's yeah, dollars and cents, and you have a, a vision of what you want to become. But it's at the end of the day, it's the mission that I find really fuels people and, and gets the best that they've got. This idea that we believe that people, everyone, have a right to great food. Like that is going to, you know, not everyone, but it's going to inspire some people like it does me. It's going to inspire people to want to come to the company because we're going to make a difference in the world and we're going to matter as individuals and as an organization. That is the centerpiece of your strategy. It's the mission statement of what you stand for. And then you got to support it with a set of values. What are, your, what are your values? What do you stand for? How are you going to live in a way that no other company does? And, and that's sort of the centerpiece of the culture. The vision is more, it's more of a business type thing. It's like painting a picture for what this business could be in 10 or 20 years into the future and, and really getting in where every word matters, like painting a picture, like writing out a paragraph of exactly what do you want this to become in 10 or 20 years? Not necessarily the mission, but the business itself. Wonder, you know, we created this, in, this incredible asset, um, you know, this, the food engineering and food science to be able to cook high quality food that could last 30 days before cooking it, where a low skilled person could cook it with the push of a button in a high speed and pinch an oven. That's sort of like the asset we built. And we just really were brainstorming, like, what does that mean? What, what good could we do with this? Like, what, what um, ultimately can, can come out of this that's bigger than, than ourselves, bigger than just dollars and cents and, and, and what we can do for customers? And that's where I think we got everyone sort of aligned to sort of rally behind that to say, wow, like, we really can make a difference in the world. This technology can bring great food to people that don't have access to it in America and the rest of the world. And once we sort of came up with that, you can just see the smiles on everybody's face around the table. Like we knew we had it. We knew that that was the highest purpose. We knew that we could really make a difference. Um, yeah. Mark, did you or someone on your team have a, a personal or emotional connection to the, the topic of, of food insecurity or um, the desire to, to nourish. It just, it does seem like you, you talk about it in a way that feels very emotional and personal. I just wonder if there's, there's a, a connection there beyond, you know, backward engineering a mission statement to fit the, 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 the technology. Yeah, no, I mean, it was true. It's sort of an iterative process. Um, but I think there was a lot of passion from people around the company that are coming to work for a food company that the very first thing they they think about is food insecurity in America. And is there a way that we can make a real impact? So it, there, there's definitely people that come in with that starting place and then the technology and it's sort of just, it's just sort of like came together that way. I think um, we all knew that we, we, we wanted to have a higher purpose. We didn't want to just build a business and sell it for a trillion dollars. Like that was fine, but not really like something that was going to get us like fired up to get up every morning. And so, yeah, I think a lot of people, including myself, came to the table with this idea that can we make a real difference? There's a lot of people that don't, don't have access to food and it felt like we had just this privilege of, of having access to great food. We'd take it for granted that, that we could eat, you know, vegetables and fruits and things and, and good food, you know, on a regular basis. And for many people, that's not a reality because they just don't have the time or the access to get it, never mind the money. Money is a separate point, but just not even the time or access of it. And so um, that was a, a big motivator. Uh, other questions, um, I need, oh, right here, and then we'll go to the gentleman over there. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I really appreciated what you said about the funding aspect too, especially like after your experience with Jet. Um, I just appreciate that growth there. My question is about with the food, do you plan on like producing 
any of that, like any of your ingredients, like growing any other vegetables or raising any other animals? And can you just walk through how you're thinking about that? Yeah, that's, that's something that we're, we're starting to think about now. So, um, you know, vertical farming, for example, is something that we're looking into that we're really excited about. Um, it's a lot more sustainable. Um, our goal is to really you know, bring great food to people and do it in a sustainable way. And I think that's not being done today. So the first order is, is just giving people access to great food. The second order is to do it in a sustainable way. And we know that a lot of food in America is not done in a sustainable way. Um, and the impact on the environment is, is significant. And so we're already starting to do little things um, like the, the platform that we're operating on now, it's all electric cooking, but we're moving to an all electric platform so that the truck will be fully electric. We're, we're thinking about sustainability, but because on the food sustainability side, even though we're doing some little things, the big boulders to move are when you're operating at massive scale and you can really make a difference because you can dictate to the farms and to the, you know, how, how, you know, uh, animals are treated and things like that, that we have. Uh, ambitious goals around, but we just haven't, you know, done it yet because we're not at the size to, to make a difference. But that's certainly part of part of it. Yeah. Great question over here. Hi, Mark. Thank you very much for being here and for sharing your story. Uh, on you, thank you for sharing what you look for in a founder. Uh, I'd like to learn more about what you look for in a company when you're investing at seed stage. Is it revenues? Is it monthly active users? Uh, is it churn? And if all of those. Um, and I'm, as an investor, much more focused on the big picture. It's sort of back to the VCP, vision capital people. It's like, I want to understand that the founder can articulate the vision and they know exactly what they want to become and how they expect to get there. Not that they've even gotten anywhere, but, but that they know what it is. It's a big opportunity. Um, they've got a strategy to get there and that they've got the capability to go out and hire the very best people in the world to execute it. Because I think, and also the ability to go out and raise capital, can they tell a story? Can they put together a compelling pitch deck? Um, because if you, if you have a big vision and you can raise capital and you're able to hire the very best people in the world, magical things can happen. And so I'm, I'm not concerned at all. I really don't care about the metrics today about the CAC and the LTV and all this stuff. It doesn't really matter if the vision is big enough and you've got the right people and the right amount of capital to execute it. We have time for one last question um, right behind the gentleman who just asked. Um, Darren, thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the talk so far. My name is Jessica Bussard. I'm the founder of Wave Therapeutics. We've created the first affordable and effective smart cushioning technology to prevent bed sores. Now, each year, 60,000 Americans die from bed sores. That's one and a half times more than from car accidents. When uh, we're, we're trying to do an affordable and effective message, and your story resonated with me because it's kind of that food insecurity story in medical. When I'm talking to VCs, though, they're talking to me about if we work better than the $4,000 device, why aren't we selling it five or six? And it seems like the message of affordable is missing them. Now I'm going to other people that hopefully it'll resonate with, but it seems like my pie is really teeny. What do I do to increase the slice of my pie, the opportunity, the people that are excited about that message? <laughs> no, I, th I think that's a really good question. I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with that as well, is that there's a conflict sometimes between the mission and what you stand for as an organization and whether or not a venture capitalist who is looking at it purely from the lens of, of can they make a return for their uh, LPs. And a lot of times there, there's a conflict there and you have to try and sort of thread that needle where you're, you're st staying true to your mission, but at the same time, also showing the, the venture community that you can make a really nice return on investment. Normally what that means is valuation. So it, it, you know, and it just may mean you need to take a low evaluation, give away more of the company so that the venture community can see that even uh, uh, you know, if the pie is a little bit smaller, they can still make a really nice return. And so I always, with, with my startups, always try and uh, show the investors 
based on on the the vision that we've got and the strategy and the financial plan how much money or x they stand to make over what period of time for their investment and sometimes you have to move the valuation down quite honestly and so in this case you have sort of two options you can either you know uh, stay true to your mission and and maybe reduce the valuation or you could sort of follow follow their lead and get more aggressive on price but then you may be selling out on your mission and so that's a choice you need to make. We've got a quantity sales opportunity that nobody else can touch. And so actually, I believe at our affordable, effective mission, we're going to end up being the standard of care in the space and own it. We're going to be the, the Xerox or the Kleenex, and we're going to make buckets of money. So then, then if that's true, then then actually it's the best of both worlds because you, you can basically do both. If you can show that you could make a nice profit and margin selling it at a lower price and get more market share um, and still create a really big outcome, then then that's great. It, it plays to your mission. And at the same time, it's a big opportunity. I was just sort of answering in case it wasn't the case that actually charging more in a smaller market was more profitable. I want to thank Jessica for the question. I want to thank Mark for your time. This has been thank amazing. You, thank you for coming to Founders House. And thanks to all of you. This closes out our, our third day. <laughs> Hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you.